Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. I'm glad that you're out. Not uh, too uh, too bad a day, but uh, glad you could enjoy the getting out together and uh, worshiping the Lord together. So good to see you. We do have many things coming up at Fairview. It's a busy uh, church season, so I hope that you'll pay attention and uh, and participate as you can. I don't want anybody to ever say we don't ask even for your blood at Fairview, uh, and, uh, and we do. <clears throat> next, uh, Willard said, he saw the video, next uh, f- uh, Saturday is the blood drive. We're doing well with in-house uh, people signed up to donate. Uh, Billy told me last night uh, we'd love to have, oh gosh, 10 to 15 more in our congregation kind of pre-register or let us know that you're going to be here and be able to give. So I hope that uh, you will you will think about that and um, and give, and you can see some of the many wonderful reasons that we should. So if you're on the fence, like Willard said, go ahead and uh, and sign up and join up. It'll be over before you know it. So we uh, hope that uh, hope that you will. <clears throat> well, this morning for a little bit, we're going to continue talking about I am a church member and. And what that means to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ. Last week we we talked about just that, that being a part of a church is not a membership like a country club or a golf club or uh, the Elks Club or the Moose Lodge, that the Bible says that when you become saved, you actually are a part of the body of Christ. The decision is yours as a believer if you're going to live that out and be an arm, a leg, a foot, a hand. Now, we know we are a body of Christ. We know we have many members here in Fairview, and we do work together to do what God calls us to do. And the second emphasis, and we're going to talk about it today, that if we are the body of Christ, which we are, we're trying to work together, there's really no way that we're going to be effective for Jesus in his world if we're not unified in what we do. If we're not unified in spirit. If we're not unified in purpose. And if you're reading uh, I Am a Church Member by Tom Rainer, if you've had a chance to discuss that in your small group, uh, you know how important that is. Now, uh, the, the, the text, the book, talks a lot about what Paul talks about, church unity. And Paul, as always, gives some wonderful, practical habits that we need to, to do to live in Christian unity within the church. We need to be a unifying presence, he says. We need not to gossip. That destroys unity very quick. We need to be quick to forgive. We need to be equipping the saints, equipping each other to do the work of the Lord. And all of these practical things bring unity within the body. And as I read that, and what I thought a lot about this week was what or who, though, is at the heart of Christian unity? What is our motivation? What's our root motivation to be unified? What's our motivation to come here and worship together and serve on committees together and sing in groups together and have Bible study together with such a diverse group of human beings who call themselves a church? And how can this diverse group of human beings ever achieve unity? Why aren't little churches, and there's still some, why aren't all of our churches little family chapels of only that makes up of our own little immediate family? Because we think we get along with each other as family, right? But no, we, we have larger congregations that we expect to unify together. Now, Unity by itself, if you just look up the definition or you think about it, uh, unity is pretty neutral. We can be unified for good. We can be unified for evil. 
and we've seen that throughout history. Uh, examples of ungodly unity or, or evil unity. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, you know, a narcissistic, um, a self-achieving man, Adolf Hitler, unified a country for evil, didn't he? They were unified. You know, the uh, youth fell into it. Even the church fell in line with it. The average citizen fell in line. And look what a holocaust we had, even a world war to depose him. In the Bible, uh, at Jesus' crucifixion, Pilate and Herod are unified in crucifying Jesus. They, they both know politically that this is the best thing to do. They're unified in it. They're together in it. But yet, it was for evil and not good. Even in today's time, in, in 1845, the Southern Baptist Convention that we still are a part of unified that we needed to have a new convention in the southern parts of the states, right? And you know why we did that. We unified because the churches in the southern part of the United States said, we're unified in saying that slavery is biblical that slavery is okay, that we can own slaves and be Christians. And so we founded the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, we got away from that later, but in the beginning, we were unified in something that was not biblical. So unity can produce evil. But there's also examples of godly unity. You know, Paul and Silas in chains, sitting in prison, are unified in that they need to praise God and they sing hymns together. They're unified in worship. Peter and Paul unified that the gospel need, of Jesus needed to be preached and could be accepted by anybody and everybody, Jews and Gentiles. And churches unified to be the body of Christ in their neighborhoods and in their world to take the gospel to everyone. So what I want to talk about today is uh, not how unity appears from Paul's perspective in the letters of the New Testament, although that's very important. I want to look at where we get the heart motivation to strive for unity as the body of Christ, his church. And so to do that, turn with me to the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 17. And this is, uh, John 17 is the end of Jesus' prayer. Jesus' prayer, and we'll talk about that in a minute, literally right before he's arrested, and is going to go to the cross. And this is how he closes this prayer. Chapter 17, and I'm going to begin with verse 20. Jesus is praying, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them 
and that I myself may be in them. Jesus gets to the heart of unity, of why we want to be one, what, why our hearts desire if we love Christ, we want to be together. First of all, he shares with us in his prayer that, you see, the source of Christian unity is, is found in the example of the relationship that God the Father has with Jesus the Son and has with the Holy Spirit. That, that mystery of the, the Trinity, where it's three in one and one in three. Those three manifestations of God or work so close together and are so in tune and so unified that the great miracle of God's kingdom gets done. We desire unity because of the amazing fact of this little passage we read that it was Jesus' prayer right before he went to the cross. His prayer for us, his purpose for us, those, all the millions, and maybe billions by now, that will hear the message of the gospel. He thinks of us. And his purpose for us is that we should desire and work for the unity in his body. Just think of all the many commandments, all the desires that Jesus could have had for us. Think of even churches today, if if we got a committee together and we said, what's the one thing we want Jesus to pray for us for? What's the one thing that, what's the one purpose we want Jesus to have for his believers? We could probably think of a long list, couldn't we? Safety, health, healing of, the, of every church member. Uh, you know, you, you can think of those in your, in your mind. Um, Meeting our budget. I mean, we can think of all kinds of crazy things. But the one thing that Jesus prays for, the one thing, right before he goes to the cross on this earth, is for us to be one. Is for us to be unified as his body of Christ, the church. That's his one prayer. And we'll look in a few minutes why, what, that, what that can do. You see, uh, Joni Erickson said, believers are never told to become one. We are already one in Jesus, and we're just expected to act like it. We're not told to be one. Jesus says we are one, just like we're our members of the body. We are to be one in unity in him, and he expects us to act like it. I often, uh, I often think, I'll be honest, any church I've been in, not Fairview, but not just Fairview, but any time we have a brand new church member or brand new guest, and, and they kind of say, uh, yeah, I heard there's a church business meeting tonight. I'm going to come. <laughs> you know, it, does that give you the willies a little bit? <laughs> Is that where we put our best foot forward? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we show the same unity, the same unified spirit at a business meeting as we do a baptism? Jesus says so. He commands us to be one. Jesus tells us how this deep commitment and, and desire for unity comes about as he goes on in his prayer. He says, basically, he receives glory from the Father. He's going to receive glory from God the Father, and that's due to him in the next days. He's going to crush the sin problem on the cross, and he's going to conquer the final obstacle of humankind, death, through the resurrection. And then Jesus says something very amazing, doesn't he? In verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. All of that glory that God gives Jesus 
for dying on the cross for the sins of the world, for being resurrected back to life as the glorified Savior. Jesus says, I want to give that same glory to those who believe in me. Wow. We can have the same glory of Jesus Christ. The same power of Jesus. That's what Jesus wants for us. And again, why does he want us to have this glory? Why does he have, want us to have this power? So that they may be one. So that they may be unified. Unity in our church should reflect the same unity that Jesus has with the Father. That's what Jesus says. He says, read the, you know, he doesn't say read the Gospels because they weren't written yet. But later, as he divinely inspires the authors of the Gospel to write the Gospel, read, and through those Gospels, one thing you see is how unified, how close Jesus is with God the Father. He never makes a major decision without praying to God the Father. He tells his followers when he's about to do something very critical that this is my Father's will. He's in tune. His marching orders are the marching orders of God the Father as he lives out life in a human body. And the only way that we can obtain unity with each other and as a church is obtain unity with God through Jesus Christ. Someone said Christian fellowship in its corporate life should reflect the same harmony as the Father and the Son. People who come in and are our visitors and our guests, people who who on the street talk about Fairview Baptist Church, that should be one of the first things that they say. We've long said we have a sweet, sweet spirit. But we need to go farther, and they should say they have a sweet, sweet spirit because that church reflects Jesus Christ and God the Father. That's what unifies them. They really love Jesus. And that's what Christ is saying. Second of all, the prayer says that the source of unity for us, the motivation for unity for us, is discovered in all of our desire deep inside. We want to witness, we want to witness the glory of Jesus. Verse 24 says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Jesus prays that, that all, the, all that believe in him throughout the ages will experience the glory of heaven. The glory of heaven, the glory of, of, of relating directly with God the Father, where that has been the case since before the foundations of the world. And I, Jesus prays that, that every believer will behold his glory in eternity one day. But you know, the more we're unified in our salvation experiences here on earth, we can begin to behold the glory of the Lord little by little. We can know him more. We can understand the glory of Jesus. We can experience his power. We'll see it in reality. We'll see it 100% one day in glory when you and I stand before him face to face. We'll realize how much we miss here on earth. But we can do the best we can. And one way we can experience the most of Jesus' glory is to be one with each other. That's what Jesus says. And then the source of unity is in our purpose. The world, Jesus says, the reason I'm praying for unity is that the world will know the Father and my love for each of them. Twice he says this. Very, 
beginning part of that passage in verse 21, that all of them may be one, Father, just that you are in me and I am you. May they also be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And then again in verse 26, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in you. The ultimate purpose is that the world can more clearly discover that Jesus is the Son of God sent to rescue them from their sin and from their death by witnessing our unity as one church, as one body. Of all the things, of all the um, programs, of all the strategies, of all the uh, cultural study that we do to try to grow as church family, to try to reach the lost around us. And what does Jesus say? The, the, number one, the number one thing that'll let people know why I came and that I love them and that I want them to see my glory as well is if they see my body, the church, unified as one. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Maybe that's because there's not many people that are unified these days. There's not many countries that are one. There's not too many state governments that are one. We even have probably debates in our local community. Maybe there's not as many um, uh, Ruritan clubs and moose lodges and elks that are one. Maybe they have spits and spats and they argue over this and that. So somebody, a, a group of people that are akin to a common cause, an eternal cause, that believe in Jesus together and that love each other and take care of each other and don't backbite each other and gossip about each other, that's going to stand out isn't it? And Jesus says that's going to draw people to the cross. The, the other thing that he said back in chapter 13, you remember? He said the other thing that's going to let everybody know that you're my disciples is if you love one another. If you have love for each other, all men will know that you're my disciples. Love and unity, they kind of go together. So what is our motivation and our source for Christian unity? Our source is Jesus' example. How he loved the Father, how he was one with God the Father. We need to be with each other. Our motivation is, and we want to, we have this desire or should have to please the purpose of our Savior. And Jesus' purpose, right before he goes to the cross, is for us to be one. And our goal is that our unity and love will point the lost to Jesus, our Savior. And then our eternal reward for doing all of this is that one day we'll behold the glory of Jesus face to face. C.S. Lewis said of unity, it's true friends faced in the right direction toward common projects, interests, and goals. And our interest in projects and goals and direction is Jesus Christ. I give you a little, uh, finally, a little physical illustration of how Jesus says we're going to be more unified in our church and in Fairview. And it's easier to do if you draw this out. If you have your bulletin or a pen or a pencil, you could do this or go home and do it later. Imagine it in your mind. But what I, if you want to draw, I draw a triangle on a piece of paper. You know, tip of the triangle here, bottom, draw a triangle. Now, at the uh, top of that triangle, put Jesus. Now, this is a great illustration for um, uh, relationships, too. I use this in marriage counseling, so you can put other names there if you want. But put Jesus at the top. On the left-hand corner down there at the other angle, put your name. 
And in this, per, in this illustration, on the right-hand angle of the triangle, just put uh, Fairview Baptist Church or members of Fairview Baptist Church uh, or even a member at Fairview that maybe you don't have unity with, whatever you want to do. <clears throat> now, what Jesus is saying and praying is that as you, if your goal is to draw closer to Jesus, that's your main goal, as Jesus and the Father. So you're down here at this part of the triangle, and your desire and goal in life is to go closer to Christ. And every other member at Fairview, or maybe the person you're thinking about, their main goal is to grow closer to Jesus. You're both trying to grow closer to Jesus. What happens to the two of you? So draw lines inside the triangle. You get closer together. And that's what Jesus is saying. Now, if you want to use that for marriage, or for a boyfriend or girlfriend, or for a mother, daughter, father, son, do the same thing, except on the right hand, put that person in you. As husband and wife grow closer to Jesus, you'll grow closer to each other. You become more unified. That's Jesus' prayer. That's how it works, is that, you know, and that way, you know, when we're, we're all trying to grow closer to Jesus, we're not worried about each other, are we? Our triangle doesn't say, try to go closer to Jesus, but also keep looking over to the other side of the triangle and worried about what Jim's doing. No, you got to have laser, you just keep laser focus on the Lord. And that relationship. And the miracle is you'll grow closer as one. You'll talk more, you'll communicate more, you'll care about each other more. You'll develop, and Jesus will give both of you the same, his same will and his same purpose. And you'll be in line together. You'll grow in each other. Paul tells us what it looks like when it's fleshed out. Jesus tells us why we desire it and why we're going to work for it. So let's be a unifying church member and a unified church that we may draw people to the cross. I'm going to pray, and praise team's going to come up, and you're ready to lead us in our last song. And um, and uh, we'll stand there, because I think, you know, we're... we're um, asking for your blood here, but um, we're also, during this I Am a Church Member emphases, we're asking for those that need to become a part of the body of Christ at Fairview, and that may be making a profession of faith in Jesus, or it may be saying, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I need to be a functioning, unifying member of Fairview, so I want you to pray about that. And if you already are a member here, as you sing and worship with this song, uh, pray about how I can be more unifying by spending more time with Jesus. I'll stand up here for a few minutes. There may be somebody that wants to become uh, a member, a part of this body of Christ, um, and claim that to be obedient to Christ. And then I'll join you in singing. And let's pray together. Lord, Lord, um, Help us to be one. We just learn we cannot without you and without modeling ourselves the relationship you had with your Heavenly Father while you were here on earth. So let us be that close to you, Jesus, that we may discover that we're close and closer to one another and that we'll all discover your same will and purpose for your church at Fairview. We ask this in Christ's name.